do this season three, episode six. Enjoy. My guest today is Dr. Rocco Monto, an award-winning orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist, internationally recognized for his pioneering clinical research on regenerative medicine and innovative approach to complex medical issues. Dr. Monto is also a team physician for U.S. soccer, a medical consultant for a global portfolio of elite athletes, and author of the new book, The Fountain, A Doctor's Prescription to Make 60 the New 30. Doc, really appreciate you taking the time today. Oh, my pleasure for having me on. I'm uh, happy to spend some time with you and your listeners. Fantastic. Well, before we dive into this conversation around longevity, um, which you describe quite well, obviously, in your book, you know, how did you get into longevity and it become an area of focus for yourself? Well, you know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so unfortunately, I see people at their best and also at their worst, and uh, I feel, you know, somewhat part of the whole medical establishment and that, you know, we've kind of let our patients and our public down a bit. You know, we're really good these, you know, at, at having people live longer, but we're not as good at getting people to live healthier. So, you know, I'm a surgeon. I'm always fixing the bad things. So I live right at ground zero of uh, the problems that come when you don't age well. Absolutely. And kind of, maybe we can start this discussion on longevity, um, to get listeners here on the same page with the blue zones. For some people, I think a lot of listeners will be familiar, but for those who aren't, uh, can you define the blue zones and tell listeners a little bit more about the insights they've given us into longevity? Yeah, you know, I think it's really been more of a, we've kind of blundered into um, all these zones or areas of the world where people tend to live longer. And, And we've backed in by using population analysis and study of just, of the kinds of life they lead and the things that work or don't work. A lot of this has been Dan Butner and um, work over the last 20 years, and uh, a lot of it was supported by National Geographic. But uh, uh, your listeners might recognize that from a few uh, very prominent articles in Time Magazine, National Geographic Magazine, and on the television. Uh, but I think what it did give us was a perspective that uh, even though we saw places and large groups and swaths of population where health that wasn't good and longevity was good. There were these pockets, these special places. And I think now we know that those special places bred special people. Yeah, it is amazing to see, you know, we go across from, you know, Sardinia, Okinawa, Loma Linda, Costa Rica, and Icaria in, in Greece. And all of a sudden these folks are living 10 years longer than everybody else. There's less chronic disease. They're more active. Um, so that definitely sort of sets the stage for how I suppose the rest of us can live longer. And you do such a great job in your book of diving into the physiology of aging. Um, so perhaps you could outline, you know, you talk about the seven pathways of aging. Could you walk listeners through a few of those key pathways in the, in yeah, increasing health span? Th- yeah. A, a lot of this has become this sort of beautiful unified me- metabolic theory of aging. And I think really what it comes down to is this, this tug of war in the body between energy and error. So when you look at the the various, the seven sort of zones or areas where in your body where the battle is being fought between uh, era, energy and error, you look at first the most basic zone, the area of the DNA, where damage is going on. And the damage can occur at various levels. You know, it's very complicated. And it's amazing, you know, this this combat, this war that's going on in your body. Um, Every time our cells divide, it's a violent act. There's damage both to the DNA and to the energy levels that it takes to fix the damage that occurs in the DNA. You know, I always liken it to the, to how we pack our DNA. It's, it's, into the chromosomes. It, I, we always thought it was this beautiful sort of Japanese tea ceremony of, <laughs> of, of everything is perfect yeah. and it proceeds in this wonderful. It's like yeah, when my eloquent. wife and I go, my wife and I go on vacation, and when I come back, my bag looks like uh, her bag's perfect, right? When she undoes her luggage, it's often when you open mine up, it's like uh, a jack in the box. Things flying everywhere, and unfortunately, our bodies are more jack in the box than tea service. So we've got to repair all that. And that's, that, that is really where all this gets down to. And, uh, um, and really, as science is catching up to 
these sort of ideas of damage. We use a lot of our energy in our body to fix the damage we do. And, and this chaotic um, life that our cells leads, uh, that's really where all the game is. So you see it in um, the breakdown of DNA every time we, we, uh, our cells divide. We see it in then the breakdown of the proteins as we make mistakes. I mean, we're really good in our body at, at quantity, but we're not so good in quality, you know. <laughs> And we've got to fix those um, those broken and damaged proteins. Luckily, we have a ways, our body is elegant ways of finding it. But, you know, we have chaperone proteins. Uh, the Nobel Prize last year in biochemistry was to a Japanese scientist who described this wonderful laundry system in our body where we recycle our own proteins. So we have these very complex, these chaperone proteins that find the damaged stuff and 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 redo it, recycle it, fix it, fold it correctly so the laundry looks good. But the problem is more energy. And that begins to sap us, right? And then it goes even further. The stem cells in your body begin to get exhausted, right? We can't replace them. We only have a certain number of those. And as you get older, the number of circulating stem cells begins to decline. And then it goes further. Our cells then have more and more difficulty talking to each other. So that communication among the cells begins to decline. And that makes it harder for us to sense energy and nutrients. That's why you start to develop secondary type 2 onset diabetes and other problems. And then it gets worse, right? It's just it's a, this awful decline. You know, it's a spiral. It's really an Icarian spiral in a way, you know, as we begin to try to fix those problems, other problems get worse. The cells can't talk correctly. Then we begin to, to try to turn on growth and the things that get turned on are unfortunately things we don't want to grow, like cancer or develop other thickening or inflammation in our cells, which drives a lot of this. And then we don't help ourselves either, you know. What we draw, we get into social uh, issues of obesity and other things that actually just turn this cycle up and drive inflammation and other the pro other the problems that we have. And and the funny thing about all this is that when I when I was a medical student when I trained, I thought all this was genetics. You got a good set of genes, you got a bad set of genes. And what we know now is that our genes are really effervescent. You know, they're constantly changing, constantly adapting. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, you do such a great job of outlining, you know, those signs of cellular aging, like you mentioned, the DNA damage, epigenetic alterations, yes. uh, you know, deregulation of that nutrient sensing. And, of course, mitochondria play a big role in this as well, obviously. The yeah, I, th I think that's the fa – isn't that fascinating? I mean, we've got these, these sort of our little symbiotic overlords that have been with us for <laughs> – just. So, you know, where are, they, where are they even come from? Where are they, you know, they really, they require payment for services rendered. You know, they give us all our energy, 90% of our energy, but they also fight for the energy with ourselves. You know, they're fighting all the time, struggling. Who gets to use the ATP? Where does it go? Who makes it? You know, who uses it? You know, it's just one reservoir we're working with. It's fascinating, though. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if we continue down this road a little bit more. I know there's a lot of talk, especially in the blogospheres around, you know, if we talk of the blue zones, whether it's vegetarian diets, omnivore diets, which ones yeah. are superior for longevity? You know, what did you uncover in your research for the book? You know, I th it, it's funny because I think that I was really bracing for that I would find some magical formula in there. You know, I thought, oh, I'm going to discover this overarching theme. I thought, oh, the blue zones, that it would be, you know, some food that they shared, some genetic background that they shared. And all I realized is that when you really looked at the blue zones, these were rough, very, very harsh areas. You know, they selected for the toughest of us. And then when you look more, at, in, go to the next level, see what they're eating, what they're doing, you know. All, the overarching theme is that everyone seems to have basically a plant-based diet. And I think that that is something I think you can take home from all this. But, you know, the more I realize, the more I realize that, you know, as humans, our, our gift really isn't our intellect. 
it's our metabolic flexibility. You know, we can live on almost anything. If you look at people can thrive in, in the African plains, they can thrive in the Antarctic ice. They can, th- even, they can live off anything, even societies that seasonally change diets. Well, you know, if you're, you know, a Hansa tribesman somewhere in Africa and you eat meat when it meets there and you eat honey when the honey's there, you know, so the diets can shift and we do this all the time. That's really, that's really our genetic advantage, you know. So I guess what I realized is that the diet it's important, right? And and I and I don't want to discount that, but I guess I came up with this a little bit of a nihilistic conclusion that it was, as far as longevity is concerned, the main thing was not overeating, which was our number one problem, you know, and that if we exercise and we we exercise, those were the powerful things that that changed the the genetic makeup, that gave us our our genetic advantage. Yeah, it is amazing when you parse through some of that research that whether you know vegetarian, omnivore, the, there's no real difference in mortality rates amongst the two in these really big um, population-based studies. And you know, you hit on it right there in terms of movement, exercise, activity. But maybe before we jump in there, you, you talked yeah. about sort of the environment that we live in today. Obviously, we about two thirds of the population now more or less overweight, obese, uh, the type two diabetes epidemic. So you know, for yourself as a as a surgeon, I mean, I've heard some docs describe osteoarthritis as sort of diabetes of the joints. You know, what do you think is contributing to a lot of the conditions that you are seeing? You know, if I had to to look deeper beyond what the real overarching issue is, it's really inflammation, right? So it's inflammation of joints, it's inflammation of muscles, inflammation, even even the, even in the way we think, you know, so. One of the biggest drivers of inflammation is uh, are, is the obesity. Really, it's you know because it it unhinges it it disconnects our ability to sense nutrients, and you know we evolved not in times of plenty, right? You know we we're basically hunting for food, whatever we could get, and and what happens when you don't eat as much is that rather than your metabolism slowing down, which is what we were always thought it actually speeds up and that's why you know I, that's why things like intermittent fasting are so powerful in how they can rev up your metabolism and your thinking and your thought processes it can change the way your metabolism functions in very profound ways yeah it's amazing today how we sort of eat you know 14 16 18 hours of the day now people getting up yes. early for work they're you know, we're snacking late late at night on the couch, so all of a sudden these eating windows have just expanded and almost flipped themselves on their head. Um, you talk a lot about, you know, the work of Walter Longo and Sachin Panda on yep. time-restricted uh, feeding in, in, your, in your book. Can you walk listeners through a little bit of, of how you started perhaps using that and how you might use that with your patients? Yeah, I think you, you hit on it when you said that people are grazing, you know. They get up early. Listen, we're a working culture, right? We get up early. We go to bed late. You know that those are that's what we do. But the problem is that we kind of, as a culture, moved into a period where we're just eating that whole time. You know, so you're constantly getting. So what does that do to you? First of all, it increases your caloric uh, intake. It, it can't help but do that. You're just constantly eating, thinking that you're keeping a blood sugars level and you're keeping this. When in fact, that's not what's happening at all. They're spiking all over the place. But Walter Longo is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant scientist. He's done some amazing work looking at, starting with population studies and tribesmen, looking to see how that how they uh, eat and how they uh, metabolize uh, food and how they function. And what we see when you take it to the next level is that if you start to narrow that window down, it does two very powerful things for you. So if you you, you do time-restricted feeding, right, that means rather than eating all day, like say you get up at 6 a.m. and you go to bed at 10 p.m., right? So rather than being up for those 16 hours eating, you say, okay, I can get up, but maybe I don't eat right away. Or I get up and I eat, but I stop early. So your window narrows. And as you win the narrow, the window narrows from 12, say from 16 to 14 to 12 to 10, good things happen, right? 
the biggest problem from people that I find that when they try to do fasting, and there's a lot of fasting fads and different versions of this, whether it's two days on, five days, or whatever, which way you want to try to fast, it's always disabled by what? By hunger. You get hungry. It's really hard to fast. I don't think anyone can do it. It's really, really, it takes a tremendous amount of discipline. It's much less much less is required if you just narrow the, the, the time at which, during which you eat. I had actually, it's funny because I tried to, I gave a talk about time-restricted feeding and I had this lovely woman come up to me after the, the talk and she said, Dr. Monto, so um, I wanted to ask you about, about, uh, about fasting. You said, like, how fast do I have to eat, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> it's not, so it, it seems like a simple concept, but maybe it's not. So what you do is maybe you don't eat right away if that works for you. But if you're hungry, sure, you can eat. But the idea is to take maybe the, even the same calories that you normally eat, but to uh, narrow them in time. So we learned a lot from studies on Muslim athletes during Ramadan, you know, because Ramadan now is, uh, you know, the Olympics will fall during Ramadan, mm-hmm. World Cup falls during Ramadan, as it did in Brazil a few years ago. And you can see that the athlete's performance actually improves a little bit, not d- d- declines a little bit. And part of that is, uh, I think, driven by these spikes in in energy levels that you get with fasting. Because the body figures, this dude is never going to feed me, right? So I need to get energy released so I can go find some food. So in a way, you're leveraging your circadian rhythms. You're leveraging your metabolism to help you. So I, I think it's, uh, again, by restricting calories without really suffering the the problems that you get with being hungry – so you can narrow that down a little bit. It's a very successful, very powerful way that you can get the benefits of fasting without really going full on. Yeah, it's definitely uh, pretty handy for folks who can sort of just have a coffee in the morning, delay that breakfast, maybe early lunch, and then yeah, all of a sudden it, the window shrinks pretty pretty quickly. And Yeah, and I'm not saying like breakfast is not important. I think it's just a lot of this turns out to be just – you know, what you define as breakfast, right? I mean, what you're defining as the break in your fasting, right? And how you do that, really, it's going to vary a lot from individual. But the same thing I I was talking about with diet, there's a lot of ways to be healthy and eat healthy that can be tailored and personalized to each individual based on their taste, based on their, their, um, their social background, cultural backgrounds that works. Yeah, and I guess that's one of the sort of problems we have in the in, in culture today. I guess is the fact that we sort of like to stay out a bit later, or work goes later, so people are eating a bit later in the evening. Maybe it's yeah, the, the, well, sure. the Netflix effect. I don't know. Everybody's on the couch yeah. watching Game of Thrones. And well, that. it's also people work at night. You know, they work these late shifts. I mean, I you know, as a as I work in the healthcare sector, and you know, you have nurses that pull these late shifts, and they come home. So wh- when does the day start and end? It, it blurs. I mean, that creates problems because it messes people up in their own sleep cycles. And you've talked about it in your podcast many times, different ways to kind of combat that. But I think uh, when you're talking about um, trying to use fasting in a very friendly way, I think that's not bad to just try to cut your meals down so you're eating everything within 12 hours. If, you, if your listeners try it, I think it's it's amazing how powerful a technique that is. It can really help you. And when you get really good at it, you can probably get to about 10 hours very comfortably. And it cuts your calorie down so that it kind of fits life. People feel better when they do that. They really do. Absolutely. And, you know, you bring in the what we I brought in the discussion around coffee, and, and you, of course, touched on coffee in your book as well in relation to longevity, health span. Could you talk to folks a little bit about some of the benefits yeah, of coffee? Wow. Potentially thank, to- thank God coffee came out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was, everyone was sweating <laughs> oh on that one. Oh, my God. Yeah, exactly. I think I was sweating bullets as I, as I did because I pulled – I mean, you got to – like the work behind the book, I mean, I probably pulled about 3,000 studies of which 1,000 – just were worthless uh, about different things. And coffee was one of the very uh, important uh, things I needed to jury for people. You know, I needed to let people know, is this in or is this out? But I think um, it, during the writing of the book, and even now, because there's some big recent studies in the UK published about the, the benefits of coffee. And I wish I could tell your listeners why it works, but I don't really know. 
and I don't think we really know. So there's so many chemicals, uh, whether it's chlorogenic acid or other things in coffee, but whatever it is, it does seem to have an effect. And I don't think it's driven by the caffeine. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter. It's whatever is in the coffee. But, yep, this this month it's in. So uh, we did find that uh, that um, amongst all studies, I didn't find a single study uh, that found uh, a negative effect. And I found some fairly positive studies, and some of the big studies out of Harvard and some other very good uh, public uh, health studies on it. Yeah, it's amazing how um, you know the recent work that came out around Alzheimer's and dementia, and how you mentioned yeah, even the decaffeinated form of coffee was benefiting folks just as well as the caffeinated form. So obviously, more going on with all those polyphenols, chlorogenic acid, as you mentioned, that are really absolutely helping absolutely. people out. Obviously, tastes really good, so that's a nice, uh, nice added benefit. Um, yeah, I think you know what was interesting too. Even though tea is not consumed in the same amounts, there seems to be also some effects, although not as strong in the population studies that I looked at. So, yeah, it's teas, yeah, green tea, black tea. It's amazing how people do get most of their uh, polyphenols from tea or coffee. So for folks who don't drink it, yeah, I think that's probably the key is in the polyphenols, and we I don't think we really understand this complex interaction between our metabolism and that. And I'm sure there's some stimulant effects, but I think uh, you know um, as we try to pick out the ways to not just live longer but to live better. Yeah, if you if you're into coffee, that's a good thing. Don't stop. <laughs> right? For sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Good for the brain. Good for yeah, diabetes yeah. prevention. Everything. So. Doc, I deal a lot in men's yeah. health, and I'm sure yes. this is something that's come up. You know, we talk sort of prescriptions for longevity. I think a lot yes. of men think that, you know, if a quick testosterone prescription will be the ticket to more muscle, better libido, thinner waistline. Yeah, I wish that were the case, but. Can, um, can you uh, walk listeners yeah. through, yeah, what you found well, in you your. Know, uh, work? Yeah, I, I think what I found actually was it's interesting because about 85% of the prescriptions for testosterone that are written in the U.S are for people with normal levels of testosterone. You know, it's, uh, it's, and there's no, absolutely no, nothing to show in the research that having more vitamin T is going to do it for you, uh, either have you live longer or have better time in the boudoir. So, um, you know, I think it's one of those things, listen, if you, if you're a man like me, I'm 58 now, um, if you're getting into your late fifties, you feel, you know, you're, you're, feeling like your energy is sapped and you get a blood test that shows that your free testosterone is low, maybe it might be worth with a doctor's guidance to try that. But you got to be super careful with that stuff. You know, anytime we're into the hormones, we also have inadvertent results. I mean, um, prostate cancer, other things that can affect men's health in a very negative way, in a very sneaky, slow way, you have to be careful with. Listen, if you work out, you're going to get a little bump in your testosterone level. It won't last long, but it'll give you that little boost you need. And I think for most men, their testosterone levels are probably just fine. Yeah, it's interesting how you know a lot of guys, obviously, typically with some weight to lose, probably not sleeping as much at night, maybe drinking too much alcohol, all these kind of things. That's so many uh, low hanging fruit that tends to get ignored and kind yeah. of look for that quick fix, right? Yeah, and then you have all the medications that guys get on. I mean, if we could get away from some of the medications, and again, this is you know a failing of the medical profession in general. You know, it's so easy to just write a prescription. You know, whether it's for depression or for high blood pressure or for diabetes, you know, what you should write a prescription for exercise. You know and go work out. And I think uh, we'd be doing our patients and ourselves a lot better service. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, exercise is, is medicine, isn't it? I mean, it's amazing the effects it has in the body. And maybe before we jump into that, I wanted to pick sure. your brain on a couple more uh, supplements that you mentioned yeah, in, in your book yeah. as well around uh, longevity. Uh, we talk about some of these marginal gains that people are looking for. So can you yes. talk a bit about the role of nicotinamide riboside and its potential yeah, I in think, longevity? I, I think this is probably one of the most interesting uh, new fields in uh, longevity science. And you've got uh, Sinclair and some of the docs up in Harvard looking at this. And I think that you know time will tell, but we know from the biochemistry of it that nicotinamide is really important um, uh, 
a really important nutrient in the body because it helps you move electrons, right? So if you can move electrons around your body, it helps you build energy. We've got to recycle a lot of that, but you know, maybe we can recycle 80, 90% of what we have, but we, we're always on that slow decline. And it always feeds back into our ability to produce ATP. So you need the, the nicotinamide or the NAD to do it. And you can only get it in a few places. You know, if you can't recycle your own, then you've got to make it. And it's hard to make, hard for the body to make. It takes energy to make energy. So a lot of the science now is can you use these nicotinamide, which are essentially vitamin B and, and vitamin B um, uh, analogs, uh, to help you. And I think there's some very fascinating early research that suggests maybe it does. Certainly, I don't think there's any negative to it. Um, it's one of the few um, um, supplements I take. Uh, but I, you know, again, I think it's an individual choice. Some people seem to tolerate it very well, some maybe not as well. Yeah, it's interesting. All the, a lot of research coming out, especially animal studies, showing a lot of benefit and starting to see some things potentially coming out around human trials. So definitely one to keep an eye on there. And I definitely would recommend your, your listeners just keep an eye on the research. I don't think it's all there yet, but it's very promising, uh, I think, from, uh, from the point of view, at least when you look at it through the optics of metabolism. 100%. And, you know, You'd mentioned the mitochondria there, and I had uh, Dr. Martin Kabbalah on last last year talking hit training, and that's definitely something yeah. that you dive into in your book. So, could you talk a bit, of maybe first around just how exercise from a at a cellular level is going to help folks out in terms of this longevity and health span game? Yeah, I think it goes back to a couple of things. Number one, um, it goes it goes to your genetic health, right? So, I think again, we always thought our chromosomes were very passive; that they didn't shift. But we now know from very, very good science, if we've gotten better at sequencing DNA and looking at markers, protein markers, we know that exercise immediately changes the configuration of the chromosomes and the kind of proteins you make. It's fascinating, you know, so that we know people that are exercising regularly are having less damage to their DNA, they're repairing it at a better rate, and they also make more mitochondria, you know? So it's one of the few ways that you get mitogenesis in your body. It's almost impossible to do it any other way. So that means more energy, and again, making less error, having more energy, works towards your benefit in the metabolic uh, life cycle. Yeah, definitely, you know, whether it's building an aerobic base, whether it's kicking things up a notch and getting into those uh, more intense intervals, obviously resistance training, lifting weights, all those things become uh, kind of just a crucial piece of the puzzle in terms of uh, yeah. just, just human health. I mean, I had uh, Dr. Andy Galpin on last year yeah, as well. Yeah, he's brilliant, he, he's, he's, he's great. great. He's you know, yeah, talking he's about great. some of those associations between things like leg strength and VO2 max and even things like grip strength um, and longevity. So that's all yeah, but obviously you know association, but all, all beneficial potential. You know what's fascinating to me is the connection between the brain and the muscle, you know? Definitely. And I, I didn't know this, you know, and here I am, you know, living in, in the world of medicine and sports medicine. And um, there's some amazing research showing like the way the brain will preferentially use the ketones and, and the lactic acid produced during exercise over glucose as an energy source. Fascinating. So up to a third of your lactic acid that you make when you're exercising immediately feeds the brain. So there is this connection um, that I think uh, we're only now appreciating. So just another benefit to, to exercise. You know, listen, there, there's not a more powerful medicine out there. there. You know, I don't care if you're talking stem cells or genetic splicing or you know, CRISPR or whatever, you know, if you're exercising daily, that's your best shot at living a longer and healthier life. Great advice, especially for a lot of folks who are struggling to get off, you know, get off the couch, it's hard. unfortunately, it's hard to get a busy off day, yeah, or, you know, work yeah, doesn't mean, permit listen, kids at home, all that stuff that no, kind of sucks. Nobody's in interested things. in my journey, you know, I mean, it, it, it listen, life, life is, uh, Life is all about your tipping points, right? You know, the things you do. We all do things for ourselves. I mean, but, it, you know, the, the one thing that's interesting, it doesn't seem to matter as much what exercise you do, right? Whether it's swimming sure. or jogging or running. I think HIT has advantages, HIT programs, because it's very efficient. 
You're doing a lot in a small amount of time. So if you're, you know, a professional or anybody, I don't care who you are, whether you're a mom that's trying to, to run the household or your dad running his household, it, you don't have a lot of time, you know, so you got to squeeze it in there. But it's completely worth it, as painful and as sweaty as it is. Definitely. I mean, as you mentioned, finding that uh, exercise you can stick to, right? Just a bit like nutrition where whatever you end up sticking to ends up working. So <laughs> making sure yeah, you enjoy it. Yeah, that's the hardest so key, thing, right? right? Yeah, you got to, it's all got to be sustainable, you know? And I, I think, you know, what I really went, was trying to do in the book was to make an argument, right? An argument that would make sense. Because it's one thing, like, you know, listen, how many offices, doctors you've been in, or you're, you know, physiologists or nutritionists, and they say, oh, you should eat less and work out more. Well, that's not good enough. That's not good enough for me. I want to know why, you know, and I want to know why, and I want to know how. And then, listen, I, once the argument is made, okay, then I'll, I'll put the work in. But I, I hopefully, at least in a small way, in the, in the book and in the way that I approached it, I gave people enough information where if they really want to take that deep dive, it's there. But if they also just want to have the broad strokes, that's also there. 100%. Yeah, you do a great job actually of parsing through a lot of the details and really digging in and then g giving a, you know, a bit of a general synopsis at the end to kind of round things up, which is fantastic. And of course, you, know, you mentioned mental health there or the mind connection. Um, and of course, mental health, crucial for healthy aging, which again, you talk about in the book. So what are some of the big rocks for you when it came to, to investigating this sort of mindset, mental health and health span longevity? Well, I, you know, for me, right, I've, I've, I've always been kind of a loner, you know, personally, you know, I mean, those of us, you know, you, you have to spend a lot of time in science, you spend a lot of time alone. And I guess what I realize is that that's probably the worst thing for my health that I could be doing that, you know, in this world of connectivity, right? There's a balance to be had, right? Now, what are good things, right? We have the internet. You and I are talking, right? Right? That's pretty cool. Where are you right now, by the way? I'm actually, yeah, in the UK, in London, England. So. Right. You're in London. I'm in Nantucket, right? So that connectivity is one of the most important things we can do among ourselves to, to live longer. But it's not just this. We need social cohesiveness. And we haven't been so good at that, right? We kind of trundle people off to, you know, the senior centers or whatever. And we really need to be more integrated culturally. You know, it, it, I think societies that do, and the blue zones are an indication of that, to go back to where we started, that one of the most important I think longevity factors about those people in the blue zones was that they maintained the cohesiveness and integrated nature of the family. The, the grandparents were there. They're part of life. They, you know, there's this affinity between young and old that is very important because you really spike your creativity when you're very young, but also as you get older. The same things we worry about, you know, getting, you know, developing dementia, these, the sort of blurring of lines in the brain also make us amazingly creative. And what do we do? Like we retire. Why the hell are we retiring for? <laughs> Why would you retire? All these years you're studying physiology and all these amazing things you've done and all the people you've talked to. Why would you ever, ever stop doing that? You know? So I think there's a big lesson here that, it's not just to make life better, but it's it's to make it interesting. Because why the hell would you want to live longer if it wasn't going to be interesting and fun? So yeah, it's a, it's it's a great point you make in the book around even uh, you know when you're 20 years old, you're more you know you're going to take more risks. But then that also f comes back on itself in the 60s, yeah. 70s, where again you know taking yeah. more risk and doing things. So I found that really cool. And of course, as you mentioned, yeah. things like community, a strong sense of purpose. I, I give you, I give you an example. I'm. I, I went, I gave a talk at a, a, a bank, right? Um, and, and, and I'm looking out in the audience and I'm like, how many of you guys are 60 years old? There's like two people that raised, <laughs> you know? And, and so I scolded the president. I said, look, you know, why, you know, why isn't, why isn't there better representation here? Because they all retiring, right? All these people have had dozens and decades and decades of experience in the financial sector wasted. When they could be helping and nurturing and mentoring. But we need that. We need that not just to live longer, but we need as a society for our own societal longevity, right? 
right? So I mean, I think there's, you know, it's funny, and I wrote this book because I just wanted to live fitter, and and I wound up living better because of it. And I, I think I kind of, you know, there was you write, you do things like, why did I spend? I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Why the hell am I writing a book on fitness? And it just became this like exploration, you know. I found so many fascinating things that had, I thought, little to do with longevity, and they have everything to do with it, you know. Staying connected, you know, talking to that relative that you hate. Maybe you don't hate them so much, you know. Be, uh, spending a little more time with your kids, taking a little time to deconnect, you know, to to to, to have meditate. You know, to get in, back in touch with yourself. We're so busy, right? And but yet being being connected uh, generationally and professionally and in many other ways. Well, do something different. You know, I mean, find something else to do. You know. Yeah, it is interesting how today we're sort of more connected, as you mentioned, sort of via the the internet and the web. But but folks feel more isolated than ever yeah, before. Yeah, that's and, fascinating. Know. Yeah, it's true. That's a good uh, good insight. I think, the, but it's. It's a we're at this time in history where we can leverage some of this stuff to be better, you know. And again, I it, the goal here isn't not to listen. It, we all want to have a great workout, you know, have a good meal. But the guy, the idea here is to have a better life, you know, to to be better, to do things, to have a purpose, right? And if you don't know what it is, you're struggling out there. You know, what do I, I don't know what I want to do. I don't want to do this. You know what? You don't have to save everybody's life. You just have to start with one, right? Start small. 100%. And it's amazing, circling back to your discussion there on meditation, in some of the landmark papers that you discuss in your book around uh, that Harvard University highlighted you know, about a decade ago and, and the impacts on, on longevity and how that mind-body connection truly is there. Can you Walk folks through what that was like for yourself. I'm not sure if you were a meditator before you wrote the book or no, how I you wasn't got into that actually. Or... No, I was a complete non-believer, <laughs> man. What are you talking about? I mean, I'm I was probably the the most vocal uh, critic of all this. And you know what? I'm converted. You know, I I think it's one of those things until you've actually done it, and you. I mean, the data supports it. I mean, it's a, and there's more and more information, and it's it's funny because you know I first saw some of the 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 research on whether it's genetic analysis of yogis i mean that's one thing but when you know you start seeing regular people that are just taking time out to to meditate in a quiet way and it, it, it the changes both genetically and physiologically are profound and i and they're lasting and i think you know as we uh, get older um uh, you know, you should. They need to be explored uh, more fur further. And, you know, whether it's Tai Chi or meditation. Listen, I don't care if you watch the Weather Channel if that works for you for meditation. You know, whatever you need to do, but it's definitely worth trying. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, as you mentioned, it's great for so many things in terms of you know whether it's pain reduction, reducing pain yes. severity, pain intensity, reducing inflammation. Yeah, I mean even back pain, right? Like yeah. lower back pain, which I see all the time, right? No med no medication is going to touch that. But if you just do meditation or something simple like Tai Chi, um, there are a lot of studies, and these are big studies, you know, VA uh, in the U.S. and other studies in the U.K. that show uh, significant improvements in lower back pain. You know, that's amazing to me. Yeah, phenomenal. Listen, Doc, fantastic insights here. I want to definitely respect your time. So. Last couple, oh, no. last couple questions here for sure. you. Sure, hit me. You know, right. What do you think the evolution of the science of longevity and health span is going to look like in the next five or ten years? You know, I think it's going to be this continued uh, slow acceptance of aging as, unfortunately, as a disease process. So you're going to start to see more research uh, in pharmaceuticals. I mean, there's a lot of investment uh, and a lot of money being thrown at this. You know, the as the baby boomers age, so goes the research and money, and so will the attention. Um, I think we'll start to better understand the mind-body connection as we start to see the benefits. Uh, and you've talked about this, about ketogenic diets in certain times of your life, right? And the benefits of, of other things like meditation or, um, uh, or yoga or other, uh, other less strenuous exercise. And also the benefits of various 
periodic stressful exercise like HIIT. Uh, I think as we start to realize we can break those secrets down that we started to discover back in the days of the blue zones and make everybody's life a blue zone. Yeah, terrific. And, you know, for folks who are listening in, you know, potentially some of the baby boomer generation that you mentioned there, you know, what's, yeah. what's one piece of advice on this topic that you'd give someone listening in who wants to increase their longevity or health span? A single best thing to do is um, if you exercise even a little bit every day, I don't care what it does. Um, you do that, right? The top five. I'll give you my top five hits, right? Exercise every day, right? Uh, coffee or tea, whatever works for you, doesn't really matter. Make sure that you focus on what you're doing. Maintain. Don't retire. There's no reason to retire, right? Stay connected. I think that if you can eat all your meals within 12 hours, that's great, right? And I think finally, uh, what it comes down to it, um, Maintaining a family structure and maintaining your purpose in life really is the ultimate uh, weapon against aging badly. And I think it also, again, makes your life interesting. Fantastic, Doc. Listen, I really, really enjoyed the book. Really fantastic read. And, you know, where can people stay connected with you and keep up with all your fantastic research and pick up the book? Uh, yeah, you go to a website. It's uh, drmonto, drmonto.com, and um, stop by and take a look, buzz around. There's uh, plenty to do and read there. Awesome. Well, listen, Doc, I'll definitely include the links uh, 